this hypocrisy, which is common to all of these environmentalists, anti-nukes, pacifists, and so on. Where does it come from? I believe it comes especially among the young from uh, the fact that they have uh, not obtained an education, not what one understands by education, what is right, what is wrong. They have never known privation, and they've turned against the system that requires a skill and a diligence with which to be good enough to trade voluntarily goods and services, and they prefer the parasitic existence of redistribution, that is, in one sense or another, to live at the taxpayer's expense. And this makes them resent corporations, free enterprise, business, and so on. And it also makes them embrace all kinds of causes, get involved, as they say, which have a number of advantages. It cures their guilt complexes, their well-deserved guilt complexes, at the same time as it is highly profitable, not only profitable in money, which it is, because uh, in all of these things, the war against poverty, which cures mainly the poverty, not of the poor, but the warriors against poverty, but not only in money, above all, in uh, esteem, in publicity, media, exposure, and so on. But it has one supreme advantage, that they can cure these guilt complexes at the same time as they wear the halo of a messiah, as they fight for clean air and clean water, as if there were anybody for, for foul air and dirty water. They can fight uh, for uh, safe houses for battered women, as if anybody advocated beating one's wife. They can fight for pacifism, as if they had a monopoly of hating war. And this, with this halo, they kid not only each other, but above themselves, and wash away their guilt complexes as they experience the comforting feeling of crusading and uh, the fire breathing uh, for a just cause. This, in the case of pacifism, is a hypocrisy worse, I believe, than in other cases. It is hypocritical because these pampered kids can never hate war as much as those who have actually seen war. It is hypocritical again because just as a nuclear power they pose as the safety supporters, when they increase the health risks and needlessly cause many premature deaths from less safe uh, sources, as I explained last time. So here they do something similar, only many times worse. They masquerade as peace lovers and pacifists, but in effect they're warmongers, because weakness has always invited war. If you look at history, you will see that wars have broken out always due to imbalance and not due to strength. And if you look at history, you will see that from the dawn of history to World War I and II, to Korea and to Vietnam, there's always been only one and only one way how to prevent war, to have the will to resist and the capacity to win. Now let me go into this question 
that is being repeated, there is no defense, nuclear war is the end of the world, let's give in, better dead than red, and so on. These arguments are false on technical grounds, and they are false on moral grounds. Why are they false on technical grounds? Is it, for example, true that the world's arsenals of nuclear weapons are large enough to kill mankind several times over? Yes, it is true. But the same thing is true of kitchen knives, rocks, sewing pins, and many other, many other objects, with which I do not mean to belittle nuclear war, because nuclear war, if it does come, if we do not succeed in preventing it, will be far more horrible than anything that we have seen so far. But don't fall for their half-truths of this kind, which they have used in the nuclear power monologue. Uh, with a single bomb, you can destroy a whole city. Untrue. Untrue, for example, to destroy a city like Los Angeles, you need 483 one megaton bombs, one megaton bombs, uh, about 50 times more energy than the bomb in Hiroshima. Well, if this is so, how come Hiroshima was destroyed by a single bomb? It wasn't. In Hiroshima, they had no shelters. Those who did have shelters, primitive shelters in their backyards, those shelters survived without damage within 100 yards of ground zero. Within one mile of ground zero, wooden, wooden houses, not concrete, wooden houses stood badly damaged, some of them beyond repair, but they stood. One day after uh, the explosion of the atomic bomb, the bridges were open to traffic. Two days, uh, public traffic service was resumed. Now, this was a city that had neither shelters nor warning. Dresden had both, both shelters and warning, and yet, in the big raid of February 1945, more people died in Dresden than in Nagasaki, and more than in Hiroshima. Which, again, I'm not saying this is going to be a picnic, don't be afraid of it, but just watch what they're saying and what the truth is. Then they say, ah, oh, wait a minute, but what is around now, the megaton bombs, they are a thousand times uh, more, more potent or more powerful than uh, the Hiroshima bomb was. They will cause a thousand time, times more destruction. False. False that they're a thousand times higher, but let's neglect that. The destruction varies as the cube root as far as the radius of the destroyed area goes. If you have a thousand times more powerful bomb, its destruction will increase by 10 times the radius of the circle, not a 1,000 times. Not much consolation, but it's very different from what they say. And then, of course, the big thing, radiation, fallout, and so on. Genetic damage, which I've already explained, uh, and there's more to it, but I uh, don't have time, uh, how they argue with genetic damage, with, uh, on completely false grounds, but even though I'm out of time, I can't resist saying something which never fails to amuse me, which doesn't really have anything to do with this. It's, it's not an argument, but it amuses me nevertheless. It is always assumed that what genetic mutations there are, and let me tell you that in Hiroshima and Nagasaki, this was investigated in a ongoing series, still ongoing after these decades, 
experiment, one of the most grandiose experiments in science, where they have watched this and where they have uh, kept exact statistics and keep looking at these people, where they have looked at the chromosomes uh, on the molecular level by electron uh, microscopy, they haven't found a thing. It is untraceable. That doesn't mean that it doesn't exist, but it's untraceable against the normal background of genetic mutations which go on all the time. The thing that amuses me is that they always assume that genetic mutations must be bad. These same people who can be driven up the wall if you say the slightest word against the Darwin theory, it's a religious thing with them that uh, as soon as you mention it, uh, you are the uh, ultimate reactionary. And yet, it is the Darwin theory that works with genetic mutations. And if it wasn't for genetic mutations, these same people wouldn't be monkeys, they would be amoebas swimming around in the primordial <laughs> radioactive soup. Right, now then, the fallout, that is, the particles that explode uh, if the bomb uh, is exploded on, uh, on the ground, underground or hitting the ground, and as the thing goes up, the particles uh, uh, become radioactive and carry with them the fission products that are radioactive, and that comes down again, and this is known as the fallout. And this fallout can cover large areas depending on the wind and they take the maps of Detroit and they put this on your hometown and you see this is where your children will bo be born with two heads for a time before the whole thing becomes monsters and dies out and so on. Well, as usual, there is some truth in this. Fallout, of course, is dangerous. but. Again, by studying the thing, you will see there are certain rules of thumbs, and some of them we know from the nuclear monologue. You, I hope you know why I say monologue instead of debate. But in any case, we know from the nuclear monologue that the longer the half-life, the smaller the radiation, the lower the level of radiation. Uh, what this means is that the high level dangerous fallout decays very quickly. The low level, less dangerous fallout is what remains for a long time, with certain exceptions for which I don't have time and uh, which I don't try to conceal. I can give you the literature. I just don't want to go into the details. But it's the rule of thumb that gets the first 80%, and then, of course, you get it, go into the details. Now, for how long do you have to wait? Well, it depends what the original level was. But you can calculate it again by rule of thumb. And this will soon show you how they're swindling as they were swindling before up to how they swindled with millirems in the nuclear power field, now they swindle with rems in the field of nuclear war. That's uh, one rem is a thousand millirems. Up to 100 rems or 100,000 millirems, which should remind you of nuclear power, you know, when they talk about one or two millirems, uh, how, how idiotic that is, because now we are talking about really dangerous wartime stuff up to 100 rems, 100,000 uh, millirems, there are no immediate effects. Above 100 rems, radiation sickness sets in, and at 400 rems, you have the median lethal dose. There is people who are exposed. Uh, if we were all, God forbid, exposed to 400 rems, 50% of us would die, 50% would be cured from radio, uh, radiation sickness. This is to give you a measure of how dangerous these things are.